and to see the major transformation that occurs in David due to what really I would say the temperamental and or I would say Abigail really mitigating David's temperamental nature and uh, as such David ultimately not being the one to take care of Naval, but as we saw HaKadosh Baruch Hu taking care of him, the beautiful idea mentioned by Chazal as well of Naval having an opportunity even of a Sergei Tshuva to recognize his evil ways. Not only is his heart and hardened in some way, if you remember from Parach but we saw at the very end, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, just as Abigail said, is going to take care by Yigov Hashem et Naval Vayamot, and uh, David recognizes that this is from Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Asher Ravet Riv Cherpati, Miyad Naval Bet Avdo Chasach Mira'a, Bet Ra'at Naval Heshiv Hashem Berosho, Vayishlach David, Vayidaber Babigaya Lekachta Lo Liisha. And David recognizes that this is really all because of Abigail, and uh, therefore we're going to see numerous instances throughout Sefer Shmuel, and continuing into Shmuel Bet Be'ezrat Hashem, wherein Abigail is really the one to temper David numerous times. And this doesn't necessarily mean, we know the idea of Chazal, that when uh, we worship Hashem, it's b'chol levavcha, b'shnei yitziracha, and uh, with all of the different vices that we have. And therefore, we're going to see a certain positive side of uh, David's uh, militant facet or militant side, but how it really does need to be tempered. And it's not just here that Abigail does this, but it seems that the words of Abigail are actually going to echo in David's mind quite often, albeit we're going to see something very interesting today. But just to remind you, we ended with David's rise to kingdom, but a little bit of the problematic aspect of already taking two wives beyond Michal. And Abigail would definitely understand it was Achinoam from Yisrael that basically and corroborated the idea of the beginning of chapter 26, of Shaul giving Michal Bito. And it seems that Michal ultimately, like Yonatan, is going to change her allegiance to her father, perhaps even over her allegiance to her, to her husband. And maybe that's because David had left her. Maybe that's because Michal decides not to run away together with him. And now she'll be given to Palti Ben Laish. We're going to revisit Palti, the Ezra Tashem, next year as well. So let's take a look at the beginning of chapter 26. We seem to have a story that reminds us very much of a more recent story, a story that we learned about just a few weeks ago, and namely chapter 24. So much so that we're going to take a look and see just how similar the stories are. Number one, the setting is similar. And we know that if that's the case, the Navi is doing this on purpose. So much so that biblical critics, as you can imagine, love the scene because for them, this is a proof that there are multiple authors, not only of Chumash, but also of Nevi'im. And as such, and makes a lot of sense, two uh, stories basically that are really two different accounts of the same story. However, we believe that when Nevoah is preserved, every Nevoah, every chapter of Nevoah is going to be significant. And therefore, there really are differences over here. And the question is going to be then, what is the significance of all the various resonances? So before we even take a look in depth at this chapter, let's see from the setting of the scene from Parachafa Pasukale, Fayavo Hazipim El Shaul Hagivata Lemor, Hello, David Mistoter Bigavata Hachilal Pne Hayishimon. The Zipim, again, perhaps because of their scare, their scare that Shaul is going to find out that David is in their region and they did not report this. And just like the people of Nov, they are massacred, which tells you, who are massacred, which tells you that Shaul's fear and is really what is preventing people from showing any type of allegiance to David. So this reminded us of that famous scene from two chapters ago, where David then is going to run away to Engedi, and Shaul is going to run after him because the Zipim are able to locate exactly where he is. And that, that's when he goes into a cave to relieve himself. He takes off his cloak. David is going to, again, somewhat reluctantly, but in the end, and is not going to kill Shaul, but if you remember, is going to cut off part of the bigot, and then he calls out to Shaul as a proof that he could have killed him, but he didn't kill him, and then uh, Shaul is going to express his remorse for all this to David. So let's take a look and see at the various parallels here in our parak. So that's what we're going to be sharing right now. But, um, okay. You can also open your email and you'll see this, but we're going to look at Shaul in David's hands, right? This isn't just 
David running away from Shaul. Rather, this time, David is going to have the upper hand again, basically for the second time. And this is extremely redundant. We're going to see just how many parallels there are between chapter 26 and chapter 24. Number one is we said the setting is the same. The two stories open in the same manner. The Ziphites and recognize David is in their midst. Keep in mind that he now has 600 people with him, and he also has wives with him. And now they're able to locate where David is, and they inform Shaul about David's location, almost in the exact same wording as well, right? It came to pass, Shaul was returning from the Plishtim. Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi here. David is in the hill of Kachila, and this is the area of Chalchul, the very steep mountains near, near Hebron, which is by the Yishimon, basically leading to the area of the Midbar. In both chapters, Shaul then is going to set out in pursuit, what do you know, with the same number, right? An identical force, which uh, we spoke about is actually the same number that he also took when he went to fight against his first war against the Plishtim, which is really ironic and clearly a subtle critique of the Navi, maybe not so subtle. Shaul, what are you doing? Taking the same number, fighting against David! who is the anointing of God, who you already noted is going to be the king as you're fighting against the enemies of Yisrael, for whom you were appointed to be king so that you could fight against them, that these are our enemies, not David. Shaul took 3,000 men and went to seek David upon this area, the rocks of the wild goats. Same thing here in chapter 26. Shaul got up, went to the wilderness of Ziph with his 3,000 men to seek David. In both cases, a situation arises in which David has the opportunity to cause harm to Shaul, and Shaul is not even aware that he's in danger. Number one, the cave, a very vulnerable state, because uh, David is inside the same cave. David gets up, wherein Shaul is without his cloak at the time. David arose here as well. We're going to see the same term and goes to where Shaul is. And last time Shaul was relieving himself, this time Shaul is going to be sleeping. So again, the contrast also between the active or proactive initiating David versus very passive Shaul, right? So it's almost as if this arouses like a little bit of our, I can't say, you know, compassion to Shaul, but he's really like in this cane here. And that's part of how the Navi wants to depict him. Number four, in both cases, David's men turn to him, and we're going to see exactly who here in our chapter, and say, Hashem has given you this opportunity to strike your enemy. Basically, look, it must be. This is how we're understanding why Shaul is in the same cave. Hashem has given you your enemy in your hands. And now you shall do as is good for you. And there, and we're going to see David, if you remember, David, it's not clear if he listens to them and then regrets it, or if he says right away, no. Again, I'm not killing Shaul, but he nonetheless is going to get up and cut his, cut his cloak. So to here, Avishai says to David, Shaul is right here. Hashem has delivered the enemy in your hands. And we discuss that this really is quite difficult, meaning they're understanding the situation of Shaul's passivity here. And uh, David's upper hand is coming from Hashem. Maybe this is Hashem setting the scene so that you can finally take over the Malchut. Maybe Hashem wants you to kill him. But in both cases, David rejects this proposal. And he says, I can't do it. And because this person is anointed by Hashem, and therefore I cannot strike against him, David is going to say the exact same words to Abishai. And he is the Mashiach Hashem. And therefore I am not allowed to do this because killing the appointee of God is basically an affront to Hashem himself. And nonetheless, in both stories, David takes something from Shaul. In chapter 24, if you remember, he cut off part of Shaul's robe. And here he's going to take Shaul's spear and also his water bottle. But in this case, he's going to, be, he's going to return it to him. Right? Once you cut off a piece of a beged, even if you want to say he could you know, sew it back on, David does not return it to him. Right? And it could be that he very much regrets the fact that he cut off, as we saw. And the Chazal say he's going to be punished for cutting off the coat of Shaul. And part of it is that he never returned it. And this was a symbol, if you remember, literally cutting off the malchut of Shaul, which he really was not necessarily supposed to do either. But in our chapter, he takes the spear in the water, so he's going to return both of them. And we'll see this as well. At this point, David turns to Shaul, asks him why he's chasing after him. In both cases, David argues that the very fact that he took something from Shaul shows, without killing him, shows that he could have killed him, so he obviously is not intending to cause him any harm. 
And if you remember chapter 24, the beautiful cry of David, why do you listen to your men who tell you that I am seeking to hurt you? Now you have seen today how Hashem has delivered you today in my hand. And yet, instead of killing you, I spared you. And you are because I will never hurt you because you are the Mashiach of Hashem. And not only that, he calls him his father. And he says, look, look at the skirt of your robe in my hand. This is what I did, and I did not kill you. So now you know, and now you see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you lay wait for my soul to take it. And you are sinning against me. You're trying to kill me, but I'm really not trying to kill you. And almost the exact same cry of David in our chapter, chapter 26, why does Shaul pursue me? And I thought you were going home last time. Why are you still doing this? What have I done? What evil? And therefore, I pray again, Hashem, and he says an interesting terminology, if it be that Hashem has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. Right then, what really is it that, and that, that you're trying to do if it's against HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then offer a korban. And if there's something that I did, again, bring that to Hashem as well. So notice that David keeps saying, it's not in our hands. Don't you see? It's in the hands of Hashem. And therefore, you're upset bring it to God. And look, look, this time I have your spear, I have your water bottle. And this is also proof for the fact that I will never hurt you. I could have hurt you. I could have killed you, but I didn't. In both cases, Shaul responds to David's words almost in the exact same way. Again, whether is, again, he begins by saying, is this your voice? And Bani David, so too in our chapter. And in both cases, David turns to Shaul and compares himself to a parosh, to a flea. And why do you keep coming after me? I'm the dog, he said last time, I'm a flea. This time he leaves the dead dog terminology aside, but he still says, I'm a paroshachad. I'm just a single flea. And so why are you coming to hunt me? And he's trying to say, it doesn't even pay. I mean, who goes hunting after fleas? And I'm a nothing. And at the last of the parallels, at the end, 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 both chapters ended with Shaul recognizing that David is the one who is more justified. He says, you are more righteous than I. You have rendered unto me good. I have rendered you evil. And you have declared how you have dealt with me. And Hashem certainly and delivered me into your hands. Shaul recognizes that Hashem is orchestrating all this. And he says, and yet you did not kill me. And so to hear, he says, I have sinned. I will do you again, no more harm because my life was precious in your eyes. You didn't kill me. And I have been the one to play the fool. I know what's interesting here is that, as we mentioned, and biblical scholars keep saying, look at all these parallels, at least 10 parallels. There are also going to be linguistic parallels and that we didn't even point out all of them because the story seems to be so similar. So uh, sure enough, biblical critics say, aha, uh -huh, it's the same story, same story. But that's a little difficult also. If it's the same story, then put them at least one next to the other. But if you remember, we had chapter 25 dealing with Naval and Abigail in the middle. So Chazal, very, very sensitive to all these parallels, explain and notice that we have two stories. Let's take a look. The Midrash Shilam says, when Shaul went off, his warrior said to him, was it out of righteousness that he did not kill you in the cave? In other words, Chazal say, these are two separate stories. And even though we heard at the end of the last story, if you remember, that David went home. It says, sorry, that Shaul went home and that David still went to the Mitsuda. Now, even though he promised David that he wasn't going to come seek him out again, he did. Because what happened? His warrior said, again, what, you think that David is so righteous that he didn't kill you? No, it was just that he was afraid of us. He knew that if he did anything, he would have gone in and consumed him. He saw this and he was afraid. It says, David knew at that time that we were surrounding the cave. And David was really afraid. It wasn't really out of righteousness. So she also wait. Again, he started thinking, maybe David isn't really so righteous. Maybe my, my warriors, maybe my soldiers are correct that David just took my cloak out of intimidation from all my soldiers. So this time Shaul says, okay, I still have the upper hands. I'm gonna get up and go to the wilderness of Ziph. But this time David cries to Avner and says, really, again, I answer you not Avner, what do you have to answer me? Surely you last night, and you said last night to Shaul regarding the cave, had he had done anything to you, we would have immediately gone and consumed him. Now, here is the spear in the cruise. And that's why Chazal say that David is going to firstly address Avner Benair, Shaul's cousin, but also his chief of staff, his general, 
and uh, to say uh, you thought that when I didn't kill your master, you thought it was because I was afraid of you. Well, do you think I'm afraid of you? I just went into your encampment and I took the spear and I took the water. So I think now you know that again, the only reason I'm not killing Shaul is I'm not really afraid of you. No, sorry. Again, it really is because of my righteousness. So according to this Midrash, we need this story to prove not just the Shaul soldiers, we the readers may be thinking maybe David in chapter 24 in En Gedi just acted out of, you know, mercy, not because he really believes it, but because he was scared. And, but this story corroborates that David isn't scared at all, that David the whole time was really acting out of righteousness. But I'd also like to mention that I think there is another idea over here, and that is specifically these two stories, as we said, being interrupted by chapter 25. The Midrash in Tehillim compares chapter 24 and 26 as if they're uninterrupted, right? Even says that David pointed to Abner and said, oh, last night you said, it's almost as if the previous story just happened, but it didn't just happen. Do you remember? And uh, Shaul in the end was called to war against the Plishtim. In the meantime, Shmuel had died, right? Meaning there are events that happen, and this seems to be a different story, but one in which the Navi wants us to hear all of the consonances so that we could also hear some of the, res some of the dissonances, so that we can also appreciate and us some of what happens over here and a little bit of a change. So Tanya is mentioning is the Abigail story placed between the Shaul and David story, similar to Tamar and Yehuda, placed between the Yosef story, indeed. Right? We know that Nebuot aren't necessarily chronologically arranged, even though here it does seem David ended up going back into the same area. And for those of you who are familiar with the areas of Jerome Har Chavron, speaking about learning and touring, it's a great place to hide out, not only because of his affinity to the people of Yehuda, his familiarity with this geographical zone, but because there are, there are mountains there that lead to the Negev and lead to the Midbar, so he has nomads along the way who can provide him with a basic provisions, and he also has the natural, the natural, I would say, security posts in the mountains, and that's going to be his greatest, I would say, protective and choice for, again, for the geographical zone in which he places himself. Was there a change in David? Is there was a change in Yehuda? Excellent point, Tanya. That's exactly what we're going to see. So everyone get ready for this. That basically what the Navi is trying to tell us is, do you remember, Nebuot is not just historiographical. It's not just the events that happen in history. And rather, the Navi wants to tell you, okay, take a look at this story. It's supposed to remind you so much of David in the previous story. But there are going to be significant changes. And these changes tell you that David even surmounts some shortcomings that he had in the previous story. And therefore, we're going to call this just like the Yehuda story, one in which Yehuda overcomes his shortcomings or his tragic flaws. So to hear David, this is going to be a better story than the previous story. Because even if it's not that David was scared of Shaul soldiers, there was something that, if you remember, especially according to the Ralbag, we left with, you know, not such a great feeling after the story of chapter 24, because David himself regretted even tearing off the cloak of Shaul's robe. And I just read, actually, last week, as I was repairing Parshat Shlach, a beautiful piece by Jacob Milgram, where he discusses by the tzitzit, right, of Parshat Shlach, he discusses how the fringes of one's garment was actually a symbol of their status. So uh, certainly, again, and people used to wear different fringes that expressed their status. So again, this is so beautiful because tchelet, as you know, is a royal color. So Am Yisrael basically are saying we're all a mamlachet kohanim v'goi kadosh. But it also tells you that David is going to cut off the corner of uh, Shaul's cloak. Basically, he's cutting off his status. And even though he's not physically killing him, it really is extremely disgraceful. And David recognizes that, meaning it's true that he didn't physically strike him, but it was a humiliating act, especially because it was done within um, the context of him removing his cloak so that he can relieve himself. So here, you can see that David is going to surmount that. And perhaps one can call it his uh, impulsive action. This time, David is going to be very very thought out. If last time, remember the Ralbaku said that David intentionally, that David himself intended 
to kill Shaul. You know, the men got him, uh, rallied him up, and he decided I'm going to kill him. And then last minute, he regretted it, which tells you, wait a second, David really does have this impulse for murder. And what do you know? Chapter 25, we saw it again with Naval. Naval insulted him. He didn't give him his food. So now David is going to go ahead and murder the entire household. So again, if you remember, who solved the problem in chapter 25? Abigail. Abigail gave a beautiful, beautiful treatise as to uh, why should you go ahead and fight this? Why uh, should this be your war? It's not your war. Again, this is HaKadosh Baruch Hu's war. You are the Mashiach HaPashim. You are going to be the one who serves as king. And therefore, you have to also demonstrate restraint and understand that not everyone is your enemy. And you can't just go off in an impulsive manner, especially for personal vendettas, and start killing people. And therefore, let's take a look. We're going to see that chapter 25 indeed had an effect on David. And therefore, it seems that we need the chapter again to show us the tshuva. And like the Kohen Gadol had bells on the hem of his garment, also beautiful, beautiful cookie. Very nice. Again, that's also his status. So David regrets having literally stripped Shaul of his status. And now we're going to see that he treats him with much more respect. So for example, here he takes the spear in our chapter. He takes the spear and literally the canteen of water from Shaul's head and and none of, no one in Shaul's army even noticed this. No man saw it. No one knew it. No one got, no one woke up. They were all asleep because it says a deep sleep from Hashem was fallen upon them. It doesn't even say Tardemat Elohim, which is interesting. And the term that's used is and from Hashem to show you that Hashem, yes, Yud Kebabke, the personal subjective God, and Hashem is involved in the scene. And David recognizes it. He sees, okay, this is all from Hashem. And just like Abigail said to him, don't worry, right? Hashem is going to fight your battles. So David recognizing, wait a second, this is a little strange that they're all fast asleep and no one's waking up as I go inside the encampment. So uh, David says, okay, this is so not me. Even though the chapter is going to start and we're going to take a look at it in just a moment, even though the chapter starts with, again, David's peers and riling him up and not to go ahead and kill Shaul, but David is going to say from the very outset, no. And not only that, even when he takes the water and the spear, which we're going to speak much more about, David is going to return it, which we said is really a restoration of Shaul's honor, a restoration of the kavod that David is showing him. So in short, one can even ask, why is there a change? Meaning there are so many common denominators, but there is also these subtle differences that show you a change in David's character, a much more noble character, a much more, one can say, mild character. And the answer is obviously what brought about this change. Chapter 25, Abigail brought about this change. And that's why we're going to continue to track and David's marriage to Abigail, that she really does seem to be a certain type of, you know, mentor in his life, really advising him what to do in different cases. So uh, we even see the linguistic parallel. David is going to tell Avishai, who's going to be the hot-headed supporter of, oh my gosh, we should kill Shaul. David is going to quote Abigail and say, no, leave it up to Hashem. His day will come. And which reminds us of exactly, exactly the end of uh, chapter 25, Hashem took care of Naval, just like Abigail said, and, and he died. So uh, this is really such a beautiful, beautiful demonstration, not only of character development, but obviously of the religious messages. It's one thing to believe, and that, I think that we can all incorporate this in our lives. It's one thing to believe that, you know, Hashem runs the show, and we know that we have to make our choices based on what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, but sometimes we even justify to ourselves, well, it must be, if Hashem put this person in front of me right now, and, and this person was hurting me, then it must be that I'm supposed to insult this person. And no, it means that Hashem is giving us opportunities for, us for these challenges, to see whether or not we can surmount them. And all of these challenges are really opportunities for us to refine our own character. And therefore, by the end of chapter six, if you didn't love David until now, you just have to love him. And you see how noble he is. You see that he sees everything as, again, opportunities from Hashem. And he refuses. He refuses, especially after Abigail's Musser, he refuses to let any hot-tempered hot personality get in the way of a pristine and refined relationship with God.
So uh, this is David Hamelch for you. So now let's explore this parak very much beyond. And part of the reason I'm doing this is not only because I love this chapter, because you really do see again David's tshuva, or better yet, let's call it tikkun. Again, he repairs even the little bit of remorse that he had after chapter 24. But we're going to see that this also sets a certain standard for the dynamic between David and the sons of Tsruya. So without talking too much about that, we're going to see that it's first introduced over here. So let us begin together in chapter 26. As we said, Shaul is going to go down to Midbar Ziv with his 3,000 men. We're in Pasuk Gimel right now. And Vayichan Shaul Begevat HaChachila Asher Al Pnei HaYishimon Al HaDerach. Shaul basically blocks David's road, meaning he knows he's in the mountains now. And for David, the easiest escape route right now would be to run off to the Midbar, to the east. So Shaul basically blocks that. The David Yosheba Midbar. And so, sorry, David again was in, mid, in Midbar Ziv. Shaul is going to block his road from the Midbar to the mountains, meaning he's to the west of David. And David right now in the Midbar, there's only... Right, he would want to hide, as we kept saying, the mountains provide greater security and protection, especially it's easier to hide out in the mountains. But now David will not be able to do that because Shaul has basically blocked that road. I can picture, just for example, the Engedi, you know, Matsada Road, and that, and on one side of you, you have the mountains. And sure enough, what Shaul is doing is he's blocking the mountain road. So he can't get back to Gush Etzion tonight, right? He can't go either through Yerushalayim. He definitely can't go, you know, the Chevron, the Be'er Sheva Chevron route. Basically, Shaul with his 3,000 men literally are going to block it off over there. So at some point, I'm just going to have to come back from the Midbar. Shaul is thinking to himself, ah, I've trapped him over here. What does David do? He knows that Shaul has been pursuing him. And here, either that Shaul is on his way to a place called El Nachon, which is very nearby where David is, or that David knows that, wow, Shaul is coming to the right place, El Nachon. And he's coming to the place that he really figured out, like where David is, and basically entrapped him. But it seems that the first Perush is a little more closer to Pshat. Firstly, the term El Nachon, and it's hard to syntactically understand it as, okay, to the right place. No, there's a place called El Nachon, and he knows that Shaul is going there. So what does he do? Vayakam David, vayavo el hamakom asher chanasham Shaul. Before Shaul goes on his way, he is going to meet the encampment. And you can imagine, he is on one of the nearby mountains. Do you remember how often I speak about how Shaul has his friends of circles that gradually is getting smaller and smaller? And we've seen the circle of friends, so to speak, when uh, Shaul with Yonatan there says, I can't believe you're my closest people from Binyamin. And, uh, you know, why you're not helping me find David. You're all traitors like my son, Yonatan. And that's when Doe Kadumi says, well, actually, I saw David in Nov. And that was Shaul's way of basically casting doubt on the allegiance of those that are closer to him. But slowly but surely, and we find that those who are closer to him no longer are really as supportive. So here we have, and Shaul literally surrounded by a circle, which also is an expression, a little bit of his paranoia, and he has to be surrounded by other people, and so we have different circles. So imagine what happens. So this in itself is going to be very interesting and strange, because we're going to revisit this in just a moment. Who is this Achimelech Achiti? He must be like some significant character if he's mentioned. And Avishai ben Shruya Achi Yoav. This is also interesting. We've never seen Avishai before. This is his first appearance. Avishai ben Shruya. Who is this ben Shruya? So again, Chazal are going to teach us that Shruya and is David's sister either based on Devrei Hayamim, his half-sister or his full sister, but basically Avishai is his nephew. So wouldn't it have been easier to introduce Avishai as the son of Tsruya, who is the sister of David? 
right? And that's how he's presented in Zivrei Hayamim. Why well, presented him as a brother to Yoav, especially because we don't know Yoav yet, believe it or not. And I know all of you know Yoav, but if this is your first time learning Sefer Shmuel, which it should be from a different perspective, then you have no idea who Yoav is. And yes, it's true. You're going to hear a lot about him, but believe it or not, the first time that Yoav appears is not going to be until Shmuel Bet, Perak Bet. So we have a couple of chapters to go. And yet, what is the Navi saying? This is, as you know, the art of foreshadowing, which tells you that obviously these Nevod are written post facto. You're going to see Yoav. Yoav is the most belligerent of all the brothers. These are, it's a team of, if you can imagine, David is a warrior, then all of his, and we've already met his three older brothers who are all part of Gen Shaul's valiant army fighting against Goliath and the Plishtim. So you can imagine that his siblings are also all these, I don't know, even his sister, and that they're all brought up as you know, I don't want to say Spartan-like, but, and yes, the sons of Tsuya are going to be very skilled in warfare, but there's something else about them, and that is that they are very hot-tempered, and one can say that David has a little bit about, of that as well, meaning it's in this family over here. I don't want to say the uh, red-headedness, but the readiness, and the, again, one can, uh, maybe even the guerrilla warfare side of them, but also a little bit of their temperament. So this is the Navi's way of saying, okay, you don't know who Abishai is, you don't know who Tsuya is, all you need to know though, that he's Yoav's brother, I know you don't know who Yoav is, but already now is foreshadowing, think of Abishai as related to Yoav, because you're gonna see a lot about Yoav, and you're gonna see that he is hot-headed, and you're gonna see that anytime he's even a little insulted, he's gonna go off and kill people. And whether it's going to be Avner ben Ner, who has an alliance with David in Hebron, and he kills him right away in Hebron, or whether it's going to be when he kills Amasa ben Yeter after Merit of Shalom, after David is very upset at the way that Yoav handled the rebellion and basically killed off his son of Shalom, then he's going to replace Yoav with Amasa ben Yeter, and Yoav just kills Amasa ben Yeter also in cold blooded murder. So we see this repetitive term of Yoav who kills people who insult, who insult David or insult him. And on one hand, you can say that it's very wise for David to surround himself with people like Abishai and Yoab by virtue of the fact that they're going to protect him. They're going to be the best secret service that a king could ever ask for, that anyone could have ever ask for. As a matter of fact, we're going to see that it's because of these sons of Shruya that the war is against Ammon and Aram are going to be taken care of. David is able to, again, to fight against them in an offensive way because he has these sons of Tsuya on his side. And that's why we find that David, at the time of the coronation of Shlomo, says, okay, you're going to have to deal with the sons of Tsuya. You don't have the same relationship with them. I couldn't kill them off because they also helped me. And it was wise for me militarily, but David knows that starting from now, he's going to have to temper these sons of Tsuya. So here's a very good example. Anna, Tanya has raised her hand. Yes, Tanya. I was just looking at the name of Avner Ben Ner. Avner Ben Ner. We're still playing with these uh, name games, aren't we? Yes, yes, yes. You remember we discussed at the beginning of Shmuel that, yes, Avner and in class, 100% that his father, and his father is Ner, and Avner is the son of Ner, and who is the brother of Kish. But Avishai, we're going to see that the parallels are Avishai and Avner. And the two are basically going to be foils, one for the other. Avishai, who is so, again, he says, okay, I will go down with you, meaning I will protect you, I will take care of you, versus Avner, who's not going to do a very good job in the scene of taking care of Shaul. So yes, very, very nice. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, let's take a look then at not only the introduction of this Av Avishai ben Suya personality, Achi Yoav, but David turns to both of them, telling us that apparently these are his two primary warriors. David is not going out with 600 men right now because he doesn't want to be caught by Shaul. So he takes with him his closest generals. Right? Basically, he only has with him these and these warriors and perhaps a few more. And he says, Who's going to go risk their lives with me going down to Shaul? And Avishai says, I'm, I'll go down. I will go down with you, giving us the impression that Achimelech is not going to go down 
which maybe underscores for us what we discussed in chapter 24. Maybe Achimelech doesn't want to go down because he's also afraid that David is going to kill Shaul. And he didn't like David's behavior in the previous scene in chapter 24 by Yengedi. So uh, again, he's going to take the moral high ground. And maybe this is also underscored by virtue of, of how he's introduced. Notice he's introduced before Avishai ben Suya, telling us that this is really his most loyal, his most loyal army servant, right? Is Achimelech the Hittite. Now, don't let it bother you that he's Hittite because it was very common to have mercenaries serving in one's army during that time. And especially, again, the Hittites coming from the north down to the south. Again, David now being in the south, could be Achimelech joined David's forces and quite recently seeing David's success and also seeing David's morality. So here's Achimelech the Hittite. Now, what's interesting is that then Rav Amos Chacham, the editor of the Dat Mikra series, he points out something remarkable. He says, you'd think, though, that just like Avishai, we're going to hear much more about in the future, you would think that if Achimelech, the Hittite, is the first person that David turns to and to say, will you go down with me and into Shaul's camp, you would think that we would hear about him again. Or at least at the end of Shemuel Bet, when we hear about all the warriors of David, you'd think that you would hear about Achimelech, the Hittite, and you don't. So Amos Chacham says, you know why? Because Achimelech, the Hittite, is actually Uriah the Chitit. Now, I don't know if you know Uriah yet, because you're not supposed to know Uriah yet. I feel, again, like I should uh, tell Becky, we don't know who, again, who Uriah is yet, but you will. You will hear that Uriah is the husband of Bathsheba, and David calls him back from war because he's one of David's prized soldiers. He's actually in the front lines fighting against Rabat B'nai Amon. And when David tells Yoav, okay, put Uriah in the front lines in an offensive battle, that's when Yoav begins to become very suspicious. Why would you, who, who do you do that to? It's one thing if it's a defensive battle. But when you initiate a battle, you don't put your best soldiers in the front line because the front line is so vulnerable, meaning you know that 90% of the soldiers in the front line are going to get killed. But that's the whole point, meaning they're the first ones to go in and yeah, they're sacrificing their lives for and for the king, for the country. So uh, Yoav wonders, why would you put in your top soldier in the front line, basically, setting him up for, for being killed. And that's when Yoav is first suspicious, which tells us, wait a second, Uriah the Chitit is a frontline soldier, just like Achimelech the Chitit. So maybe they're actually the same person, proposes Rav Amos Chacham, because linguistically, think of even right in your notebooks now, again, Achimelech, very often we know, again, like Achia, we saw Achia, the son of Achituv, again, who's described in Perek Yudalid, or Achimelech, again, oh, he'll also come up, and he also came up again in Perek Chafbet. So Achimelech is very often called Achia, right? Achia, the son of Achituv, Achimelech, the son of Achituv, they're one and the same. So Achimelech is Achia. So if Achimelech the Chittite, his nickname was Achia, can everyone write down Achia in, in, in what's called the Assyrian Hebrew text, and even in ancient Hebrew, if you write Achia, it's very similar to Uriah in its letters, right? The jump is not very far because the Hebrew letters are so similar. And therefore, again, it seems that Achimelech then is in fact Achia, who's Uriah, who's a mercenary for David, but he becomes David's most loyal soldier. And he becomes not just a, a loyal soldier, but a moral soldier. And that's why he likes being with David. But whenever David, he feels, is compromising on morality, then he's not going to join him. So he's suspicious. He's suspicious that maybe David is going to do something embarrassing to Shaul again, and he doesn't want to have part of it. So again, now we're going to take a look at all this, but I see a few chats here. You did ask, do we ever get a sense of what Shaul's soldiers are thinking about the irrational behavior of their king, like blocking the road from David? 100%, meaning they understand that Shaul is in hot pursuit of David and wants to kill David. And even though he, there definitely is a group that keeps telling him, don't, and David is uh, the one chosen by Hashem. 
what David recognizes about Shaul, you're chosen by Hashem. Shaul himself had said in chapter 24, oh my gosh, now it's so clear to me that you're going to be the king. So I can imagine his soldiers, you did that's an excellent question, thinking, okay, you know, he's going to be the king. He's not killing you who are the king. Why would you want to kill him? But I think by now they're used to his irrational behavior and uh, they're still loyal servants. So even though we don't find, you know, huge numbers of supporters, he still has supporters and our sense is that they're supporters more out of fear than they are out of love, right? They're probably so afraid that, and he'll go ahead and kill them just like he killed the people of Nov for what doesn't have to be interpreted as any sign of rebellion against the king. But he sees any little help to David as an offense to the king, as a Morid the Malchut. So I imagine that that definitely is part of the motivation of uh, his soldiers encouraging and accompanying him. And a cookie asks, if Uriah was a Hittite, how was he able to marry Bathsheba? Was this considered intermarriage? That's a great, 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 great question. And Chazal even say that Bathsheba was the daughter of Achitophel. And he was uh, David's primary advisor from a very distinguished family in Gilo, right? Which was, again, the outskirts of Yerushalayim till today. And uh, as such, and it, we're wondering, how could it be? Again, Bathsheba married a non-Jew. So again, what do you call someone who lives, uh, please remember during the time period, especially the first Beit HaMikdash, what do you call someone who lives amongst Am Yisrael and basically is going to serve in the army and uh, for all intents and purposes is going to see himself as part of the Jewish people? We call that person a, a ger. So yes, Uriah is a ger to Shav. And you're thinking, how can someone from such a distinguished family marry a ger? So notice there's precedence for this. And, and it also... So certain to be, it should remind you of David's own, again, own backgrounds. That, what do you know? Boaz married a Gioret, right? And here we have, again, Bathsheba married, married this Ger. Why would Achitophel marry off his beautiful daughter again to a Ger? Well, we've already seen that if Uriah, again, is this Achia, in fact, that Uriah is David's, he's basically, right, the top soldier in David's army. He's a very distinguished moral man. And Achitophel wants him as a son-in-law. So it actually makes a lot of sense. And uh, there wasn't a problem of intermarriage then. Intermarriage basically meant, and or when you married someone, if he was going to live within the Jewish people, then he was, for all intents and purposes, converting to the Jewish people. So yes, you're also thinking about Ephron Hafiti, meaning the Chittites, the Hittites originally live in the south, again, in the areas of Hebron. Many of them move up to the north, or most of them move up to the north. Here we see that some of them stayed in the south. And uh, yes, getting control of Hebron for Malchut, Yafbe Ma'od. And uh, so here, yes, so definitely Shaul rules by instilling fear. And now we have a sense of this Achimelech the Chittite. So uh, the reason why I'm already mentioning this now is because we're going to see this Be'ezrat Hashem in uh, the Bathsheba story. And now this makes the Bathsheba story all the harsher because then the Bathsheba story is going to for force us to revisit this story. So notice this. Again, this is so remarkable from the Navi's perspective. We have chapter 24, which was David, albeit not killing Shaul, but still disgracing Shaul and then regretting it. Then we have Abigail telling David, don't do this. Again, don't disgrace Shaul. Don't disgrace yourself. Don't fight wars for personal vendettas. Leave those up to God, right? You have to learn, David, how to properly channel your emotions. Oh my. Here, we're going to see David does. He channels his emotions. He's so great, excellent, but it seems that there is still something missing a little, and that is that he didn't make his intentions clear. What happens? Notice Pasuk Vav. He says to Achimelech Achiti and Avishai ben Surya Achio Yoav, Mi yireid iti el Shaul el hamachaneh. When someone says that, when David says, who's going down with me? And to Shaul and to his military encampment, the sense that you get is, oh, David's going to fight. And that clearly is what Achimelech you know, thought and therefore is not going to accompany David. In other words, David did not make his intentions clear. And maybe his intentions weren't clear until he actually got to the encampment. But why is this significant? Because we're going to see a case where he wasn't able, he didn't overcome his uh, impulsive reaction. And that's going to be in uh, the story of David and Bathsheba. And I don't just mean the impulsive reaction of sleeping with Bathsheba. 
I mean that right after he finds out he's pregnant, what does he do? He says, okay, I'm going to have to, you know, cover this up. How? Impulsively, he says, by killing Leah. Right? And uh, that is going to bother us and basically say, wait a second, this is the tikkun, but I guess he didn't repair it 100%. He still has this. But don't worry, after the story of Uriah and Bacheva, he's going to live out the rest of his days basically regretting this, right? He's going to live out the rest of his days and recognizing, oh my gosh, I did something wrong. And he's going to notice and he's going to do tshuva. And the story of Bacheva, albeit Definitely a stain on, you know, David's career ultimately tells us that he can overcome and he can overcome entirely. And maybe that's why in that story too, we're going to not only see similar terms that remind us of this story, but we also hear, again, interestingly about Yoav and that story. And we hear that David later on, again, it's going to be the same. We'll get back to Avishai we're going to see that David is always going to recognize that he's living after the story of Bacheva and his, you can say, second degree hand in murdering Uriah. It's always going to be in front of him, as he says in this morning, Zayin and Tihilim, Hatati Lechanai Tamid. And my sin is always before me. And that's going to be part of the process of tshuva. But let's take a look, and we're going to see this. And this is so remarkable in the David and Bacheva story. I didn't write out all the parallels here, but here are just a few. David's going to say to Uriah, in your mind, think of him as Achimelech, as Achiyad Achitait. He's going to say, go down to your house, wash your feet, and then go, you know, go sleep with your wife. And Uriah left, but he didn't sleep with his wife. Because again, Uriah says, I am a devoted, loyal servant to the king. I am not leaving the king. And he was called back from, from Miluim. He was called back from the army. So Uriah still sees himself on duty to the king. So he slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants and he did not go down. And it says it again, he did not go down. And David said, didn't you just come from the war? Why did you not go down? And Uriah says, because I'm still on duty for the king, which shows his tremendous loyalty. But notice in both cases, he does not go down. The same terminology of vayered, nie rediti. And obviously that carries with it other connotations as well, not just geographically going down, but one can say morally going down. And Uriah says, I am not going to be part of this with you. And yes, Becky is saying this reminds us of what Shaul did when he sent David into battle, hoping to kill him. That's right. And he was unsuccessful. And unfortunately, Uriah is going to get killed in that war against, against Ammon. So with this, oops, and let's take a look and see. And this was Achimelech Achiyah, Uriah, who does not go down with David. But who is going to go down with David? Let's take a look. Avishai is going to go down with David. And as we said, David does not make his intentions clear. So uh, this already tells us that Avishai, and even though he wasn't the first one addressed, he's going to come in and say, I will go down with you. And this already gives us a sense, and we're going to prove it right now, that Avishai is thinking, David must be thinking, this time I'm going to kill Shaul, right? I can't believe he had the audacity to come ahead after he told me that he wasn't going to pursue me anymore, and he's pursuing me. And Avishai is going to say once again, you see, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving Shaul in your hands. So let's take a look at Posuk Zayin, Vayavo David Vavishai El Ha'am Laila, Vinei Shaul Shochev Yashem B'Ma'agal. As we said, a little bit of a pathetic scene. Again, Shaul is sitting or sleeping and in a, a circle. Remember that chanit of his, that spear? When you think of Shaul's spear, what are you thinking of? Everyone just yell out. What are you all thinking of? Okay. The tool to kill David. Thank you. Again, 100%. Again, the spear that he used to kill David, literally, to, again, to uh, pierce him to the wall, if you remember that terminology. The chanit that is always by his side. Again, as a, a sign then, every time we think about the chanit, that is really the expression of his aggression towards David. So notice, again, the chanit, telling us that this is still on the top of his mind. Literally, the chanit is right by his head. That's what he still has in mind. And his foremost concern is killing David. But Avner, you know, they're all there, just like you did pointed out, more out of fear. And they're really there to protect the king. 
right? They see themselves as the vassals of the king. So on one hand, we see Avishai thought that this must be what David wanted. He said, right after David says, who's going to go with me? Then Avishai says, oh my gosh, you see what's happened. Wow, Elohim has given you your oyev. He's right over here. I'm going to take the chanit. And uh, this is, you can imagine, just like David took Goliath's sword to decapitate Goliath, this is, again, a, a very humiliating form of death, taking the victim's own weapon and killing him, right? We're going to revisit this when we get to the end of the life of, Sha of Shaul, but Avishai says, I'll take the Hanit, and I am going to, and literally, Akenuna What does this remind you of? of Shaul attempting to strike David. Again, again, pierced him to the wall. Again, in the case of Shaul, Shaul did it twice and he missed. And in this case, Avishai says, I'm a skilled warrior. Give me one chance, David. I'm telling you, I'm going to get it right. I will pierce him. Again, I will pierce him with a one, one blow of, of the spear. Again, basically, boom, pierce him to the ground. David, as opposed to the last time where he was silent when his men said, come on, I think Hashem wants you to kill him. David didn't say anything. And the Rabbank says maybe because he really did intend to kill, to kill Shaul. But even if he didn't, he didn't say anything. And this time David says, Chai Hashem. Verse, he says, Al <coughs> Do not. Who can strike the anointing of God and be absolved? And David says again, and you can imagine there's a double Vayomer, Vayomer David, and again, Vayomer David, between Sukim Tet and Yud, <coughs> the double Vayomer phenomenon. Again, and David said, and David said, and why do we need to introduce the, David as the speaker? So again, we know that this means that there was some type of unspoken response. You can imagine that Avishai is very disappointed, or Avishai is looking at David in a very bewildered fashion. I don't understand why you're not taking advantage of this. Or I thought that that was your mission. I thought that's why you invited me to come with you here, to kill Shaul. And David explains, Chai Hashem, Kim Hashem Yigafenu. He's quoting Abigail. This isn't my war. I swear in the name of God, God will strike him. I will not be the one to strike him. Oyo moya vova met. Or the day will come wherein he's going to die. And to a certain degree, this is a nevuah, right? Niva velo yadash niva. Because on one hand, Hashem is going to set it up in such a way that he dies. But really, he's going to die. One can say in like a natural state of war. But actually, he's going to. He's going to be the one to kill himself. We'll take a look at this. Or he's going to die in war. And the truth is that all three of these come true. Meaning it's Hashem. It's also you know, somewhat natural causes, as we'll see, but also going to be the enemy hands. And that's in fact, right? David says, no, that's not why we're here. No, again, this is beyond. And uh, this is why we're thinking, you know, you just should have told Achiyah this also, you know, Achimelch would have understood this as well. He says, I will not strike the Mashiach Hashem, Vata. He says, but if you want, you can take the spear that's by his head and and the canister of water, and then we will go. And look at the next pasuk. And the end, it wasn't even Abishai who takes it. Rather, David on his own risks his life. Think about this. He's tiptoeing over Shaul and literally risking his life to take the spear and to take the water. Right by his head. You sh you're supposed to have butterflies as you read this. Right? It's the middle of the night. Again, you can hear everything. And David can so and surreptitiously make his way right by his head. By Yehulahem, the Ain Roe, the Ain Yodea, the Ain Mikitz. And can you imagine this? No one stirred. No one woke up. No one knew. No one saw. Yehulam Yeshinim. Come on, how often do you have that? It's a campsite of 3,000 people. How did no one see David and Abishai? Yitardema Tashem, Nafla Alehem. It wasn't a Tardema Luki. It wasn't a you know, just a powerful sleep it was HaKadosh Baruch which helps us realize, wait, why would Hashem do this? And the answer is because Hashem wanted David to have this tikkun. 
Hashem wants to see, is David going to let his hot-tempered nature or even Abishai's hot-tempered nature get the better of him? And the answer is no. And we see then the difference between David and Abishai over here, right? Abishai is going to the camp thinking David is going to kill him. David is going to the camp thinking, no, no. I want to show Shaul once again that I have no intention of killing him. So again, it's Avishai who says, don't you see? This is what Hashem wants. He says, it must be. And uh, wow, and the gar elokim hayom. Hashem is uh, protecting you from your enemies. And David says, no. Hashem is going to kill my enemies. And I don't have to be the one to do it. And sure enough, the Radak says, and uh, why is it that, and that in the end, David took the spear and he didn't, he told Abishai initially, you take the spear, but then he takes it. The Radak explains, after he said to Abishai, again, you think that he regretted because he was afraid, oh my gosh, if Abishai gets too close to Shaul, then maybe he won't be able to control his passion and maybe he's going to smite him. So David in the end, this is like, and he's the one who takes the water and the spear of Shaul. Now a little bit more of Abishai. We're going to see, and I don't want to give away too much now, but this is going to be, as we said, not only a foreshadowing to Bnei Tzuya, and uh, two, also Yoav, and we'll see uh, the other, and uh, son of Surya, and uh, the uh, Sa'il, also very uh, um, hot-headed nephews that David has over here, but at the same time, very loyal to David, and notice that David is able to temper them, just like Abigail was able to temper him. But there are going to be times that it's going to be very difficult, as we said, Yoav succeeding in assassinating Avner and Amasa ben Yeter, but with all this, we're going to see this coming again when David is running away from, from Avshalom and he's crying. And then Shimi ben Gera from Shevet Benyamin comes out of Bachurina to curse David. You can imagine it's Avishai who's going to say again, oh my gosh, he's a Mori ben Malchut, we have to kill him. And David says, no, don't you see he's from Hashem? He's from Hashem. And this reminds us of this scene. And it could be that he realizes it's because of how he mistreated Uriah that Hashem is punishing him through Mered Avshalom. So all of these scenes are going to recur and each one serving as a further tikkun. And it's interesting that yes, Avishai appears in uh, both of these scenes really as a foil for David. So uh, to uh, get back to some of the questions over here. And uh, for example, here we go. And, uh, Becky also said he must have sent Bathsheba, again, again, before the war. So we'll talk more about that, but Israel Hashem. And when we take a look at the, at the Bathsheba story, and why would Abishai offer to do the killing and not David? Because uh, Abishai is really, again, hot-headed L'shem Shamayim. He says it, Sigara Lukim Hayom. David, I think that's why you invited me, right? Because you know that I'm a good warrior. I'm going to do this for you. And uh, I'm going to show you, again, that this is really what God wants from you. And David says, no, I'm telling you, that's not what God wants from me. So we have almost like a role reversal from the previous chapter that this time David plays Abigail's role and, uh, and Abishai is the, uh, you know, hot-tempered David who wants to kill. So Leia saying as well, you sense that until David reached that moment, he hadn't realized that he was, wasn't out to kill Shaul. So that's exactly what still remains a question after 24. And after Parah Dalid, just like the Midrash says, people... Again, and maybe even David is wondering, why didn't I kill Shaul? People are saying, ah, oh, it's because he was really afraid of Shaul's armies. And no, it was because he, and now we know, it was because he had no intention of killing Shaul. But then if you remember, so you're supposed to say, what shuva does he need? Because even though he didn't have an intention of killing Shaul, he still cut off his cloak. And that's a disgrace, right? You don't disgrace the king that way. And you're supposed to say, well, taking the spear in the water is also a disgrace. But don't worry, David's going to return it. And returning it as a way of paying homage, right, of showing respect. So uh, could it also be the Sharvit of the king? Meaning the Hanit, the Sharvit, okay, which means that David didn't want anyone else to touch it, like a Hashverosh, okay, but it's really his spear, meaning it's a weapon, and David is saying that it's in his hands, and he, he could do what Avishai said to do with it, namely, he could pierce Shaul to the ground, but he's not. He's going to take Shaul's, and you can imagine this, the same spear that he used to try to kill David. David could say, okay, Mida, can I get Mida? I see the spear. I have such, you know, a trauma and a post-traumatic stress disorder over here, and I'm going to take that same vehicle. 
that you were trying to kill me with it, and I'm going to kill you with it. And one could argue, it really is Habala Hargacha Hashkem Lahargo. Shaul wanted to kill David with that spear. And yet David's going to take it. He's going to say, I'm not going to use it. Not only that, I'm going to return it. And it, which shows just how, really, just how moral he is. And not how much he sees this. He even regrets and even suggesting to Avishai that maybe Avishai should take, a, should take the spear in the water. So let's take a look now at this encounter. What happens after David takes the tzapachat and takes the spear and explains to Avishai he has no intention and didn't have any intention of killing Shaul at all. He just wanted to corroborate that he has no intention whatsoever. That's why he went down. He went down and knowing that, okay, he could have really stayed in the Midbar if you think about it. And he could have stayed right there and then let Shaul pursue him. But he wants to show Shaul that his pursuit is in vain because Hashem is protecting him, meaning David, and David isn't going to kill him, meaning it's not a, a, a confrontation in any way. And uh, that's what he's going to say. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's what he's going to say right now. So let's take a look, and we're going to see these words starting Pasuk Yigimel. Vayavor David ha'ever, vayamod arosha harmi rachok, rav hamakom b'nehem. And this is so interesting, by the way, because it says that David then crosses over, and now he's standing at the edge of the mountain. Now, many person may explain he's going back, you know, to the Midbar direction, but actually topographically, it could be that, believe it or not, think about it this way, David's army is actually to the east, or David's encampments are somewhere to the east, and David is going to go to the west, right, to the areas of the mountains, as he talks to Shaul, showing him that he's really not afraid of him. He's going to this other, and so that, that's why he's going to this other side, right, of, of Shaul. And with complete confidence, he stands on the top of the mountain, but with enough of a distance between them. And David calls El Ha'am del Avner Bener. And he doesn't embarrass Shaul initially. He calls out instead to the people to Avner Bener. And saying, Hello, Tane Avner, Avner, this is really partially your responsibility. Vayan Avner, Vayomer, Miatak Harata El Hamelech. Who are you that cries out to the king? And some of the person who explained that Avner wakes up and he sees exactly what happens and he realized that, oh my gosh, David crossed over to the side and no one caught him. And maybe he's actually saying this not to David, but Miatak Harata El Hamelech, who are you? Who are you, the soldiers, who didn't catch this? And as you know, this is just a way of projecting one's own or defense mechanism that he's saying, oh my gosh, how did I laugh for this? How did David cross over our encampment without me noticing? Hello, Ishata. You're a very noble man. You're a valiant man. Why did you not protect Shaul? Because, and notice that one of the people, right, he's calling himself or Avishai, just, you know, an Am Ha'aret, then came to kill or could have killed and didn't. You really deserve to be killed because you don't watch over Shaul, right? And he could have been killed, in which case you're the ones responsible because you're the bodyguards. He's rebuking them. He says, look, and someone could have killed your, your king today. And that would have been terrible because your king is a Mashiach Hashem. So notice this, even as he's talking to Avner, he's lauding Shaul's position as a Mashiach Hashem. And now we understand why he's not talking directly to Shaul. He's telling Avner, I protected Shaul, right? Everyone see the contrast? I didn't kill Shaul. You basically kind of like passively killed Shaul by not protecting him properly. Obviously, these two, and uh, two major, I would say, necessities in war. So where's his weapon and where's his water that one keeps closest to them? And instead of Avner answering, what happens? Almost the exact same terminology that we saw in chapter 24. Shaul recognizes David's voice. I can imagine like Shaul waking up from this, you know, stupor 
and saying like, what is going on, right? What's David doing here? And his initial reaction is not, oh my gosh, let's go after David. It's, it really is. David. He brings him back to, wait a second, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? David and David continues. Again, the double Vayomer, giving us a sense that there was some unspoken reaction of Shaul here. Right? Maybe he's looking around saying, like, what is going on? Like getting his bearings straight. And I can imagine him getting up, like looking for his fear, entering into a state of panic, and then like seeing David. And we're going to see that David has his fear held high. Right, reminiscence of Yehoshua and his kidon, right? Basically showing he's won this war, even without killing anyone. And yes, again, Cookie's also saying this term of Vayaker Shaul reminds us of Yehuda, right? Vayaker Yehuda et Ketone Tapasi. Or again, Vayaker Yehuda, Yehuda saw the Ptilim, again, everything that he had given to Tamar. Or Vayaker Yaakov et Ketone Tapasim. But when David, or when Yehuda recognized that Tamar had all of his personal belongings, he immediately says, Set Kanimani. Let's see. And I think that Cookie's right, that the Navi is using this terminology almost to get us excited that maybe, maybe Anna Shaul is going to recognize his wrongdoing. And we're going to see that he doesn't admit it right away. He doesn't have that Yehuda gene in him. Because he's from Benjamin. Let's look. So David, right, waits till Shaul realizes what's going on. And he says, really, why is my master chasing his servant? What did I do? So please, now that I have the upper hand, you listen to what I have to say. Yarach mincha. And the Parshanim ask all different questions here. What does it mean? And he says, if, then I pray, if, then Hashem, Hashem is doing this to you, then Yarach mincha, then bring a sacrifice. So some Parshanim say, is he like mocking HaKadosh Baruch and saying, okay, you can just bring a sacrifice, Hashem? No, he basically is saying, do something to God. Submit yourself before God. And don't take your anger on Hashem out on me. And if you feel that, that you have to do something, that Hashem is angry with you, then bring him a, him a carbon. So here's another explanation of the Abar Benel, right? Who says, okay, and im Hashem his sitra, if Hashem is setting you up here like a Satan, and sure enough, Chazal say, wait a second, then even this is going to be a little, maybe David didn't do a full tiku, and he's mocking Shaul a little, he's going to be punished, mida keneged mida, by Hashem being Mesit David. At, and now we'll see the story at the end of Shemuel, that Hashem making David forgetting about a basic law. If he's like mocking Shaul, okay, everyone knows Shaul, like if you did something wrong, you bring a korban. For mocking Shaul for something so simple, so to speak, he is going to forget that when you conduct a census, you have to ask for a machatit shekel. And David forgets that. And in the end, conducts a regular census and is going to be severely punished with a plague. So uh, here we see sometimes it's the little mistakes. Right? Sometimes it's uh, literally mocking people that brings upon terrible plague. Im Hashem hisitchabi, yarach mincha. The Barbanel says that what he's saying is, if you feel that this is from Hashem, then do something about it, meaning recognize that you should do something and don't make it worse by trying to kill me. Bring a korban. And if you have something against the people themselves, again, notice what he says. And what are you doing, though, taking this out on me? And if you feel that I did something wrong, then... And he says basically what Abigail says also. And even if I did something wrong, you shouldn't be the one to uh, take care of me. Let Hashem take care of me. Right? And he's hinting to, don't worry, Hashem is going to take care of me in a positive way, not a negative way. But these words are also very difficult because what is David saying? He's saying, if uh, Hashem is really the one responsible for 
and you're angry with him with me, then bring him a carbon. But if it be because of people like me, then I guess, and he says, but notice what you're doing. You're making the matters worse because you're still responsible. Because by chasing after me, you have driven me out. And from being in the Chalat Hashem, Limor, it's as if you said, go and worship other idols. And Chazal say, from here we learn, Kol Hadar B'chutz L'aretz, Ki'ilu Oved Avodah Zara. Here you see it. Ketuvot Daf Kuf Yud Amud Bet. Yes, you should all know this by heart, to quote to all of your peers in Chutz L'aretz. Someone who lives in the Chutz L'aretz, it's as if he's worshiping other idols. As I'll say that here now, Mesach HaKtuvo talks about a relationship, a protective relationship between a husband and a wife, and therefore the end of Ketuvo is actually all about and when you can divorce your wife, again, if she wants to make Aliyah, you have to give her a Ketuba, but it's really all about our relationship with Eretz Yisrael. It's almost as if Eretz Yisrael is the Ketuba in the marriage between Hashem and Am Yisrael, which is really beautiful. And then we find and the, uh, all the different, not all, but many of the statements of Chazal dealing with uh, our relationship with Eretz Yisrael, the mitzvah of Yishev Eretz Yisrael, the machlok between Rabbi Huda and his Talmud Rabbi Zera, who wants to make Aliyah, and where the fruit better, and where is, uh, again, the religious sense better, and Chazal say you can't compare. And Eretz Yisrael is Nachalat Hashem. So a person should always live in the land of Israel, even in a city where the majority of whose inhabitants worship idols. And he should not live outside the land of Israel, even in the city where the majority are Israelites or Jews. For anyone who lives in the land of Israel, it's as if he has a God. Anyone who lives outside the land of Israel, it's as if because he doesn't have that national recognition of God. And he says, where do we see this from? Both the Pasuk in Vayikra and that Hashem has given you this land to be your God. And one who does not live in the land of Israel, what does it mean that he doesn't have a God? Rather, it means it's as if he's worshiping idols because of it says that explicitly, you see, because you were pursuing me, why were you doing this? You ended up causing a worse evil. Not only did you not give a carbon to Hashem, but you made me worship idols. What does that mean? David was not worshiping idols. No, you put me in a state of a possible assimilation. That's what he means. And by the way, why can David say this? Because his ancestors did leave Eretz Yisrael. Do you remember? And Elimelech, Nomi, Machlon, and Chilion, and what happened to them? They assimilated and they died. He says, you're putting me in a very, very vulnerable situation. Not only are you not offering a carbon, you're not letting me and be religious. And David definitely knows the danger of assimilation, not just from his own family, but we've already seen in previous chapters, he's gone to the lands of the Plishtim. He's gone to the Moabites, right? He sees the different culture. And therefore, Hazal say, when David says, then that you have driven me out of this land, that I should not cleave to the inheritance of Hashem, who told David, go serve other gods? You mean David serve gods? No, no, no. He's telling you, you put me in a dangerous situation. I could be worshiping idols. You uh, put me in a situation where I had to leave Eretz Yisrael. That's a very, very harsh statement, right? And here we see then, and uh, let's take a look, what happens? He says, so, and now that I'm here, don't do anything worse, right? Don't kill me. I'm not even a dog, which we said appears very much during this time because the Plishkin, you know, worshipped the dog. And it says, I'm not even a dog, meaning so in Am Yisrael culture, the dog became like the lowliest of the animals, like an animal for Avodah Zarah. He says, I'm not even going to call myself a dog here. I'm a parosh. I'm a flea. Like who goes after fleas? No one does. And sure enough, Dana Cookie saying, well, this time Vayaker and Shaul says, it took a while, though, and, and it ends, though, the same way that chapter 24 ended. Shaul says this time, Chatati, shuv b'ni David. I've sinned again. Hilo ha'od. But that's it. No more. I'm not going to do any, anything else. I know. And now I know for sure that when you didn't kill me by Engedi, it really wasn't out of fear of my soldiers. It was because of your righteousness. Because you valued my life. And you didn't kill me when you could have. He made his kalki the eshke habe maod, and now I look like a fool. Vayan David vayomer he may chanit hamelech. Here is the chanit of the melech, and you'd think that he would hand it to him personally, but David is still scared. <laughs> so instead, vayavor echad miham na'arim vayikachah. Then an intermediary, one of the na'arim, comes to take it. 
והשם ישיב לאיש את בדקתו ואת אמונתו אשר נתנך השם היום ביד. And he's saying, Hashem then, once again, then I shall reward you for your righteousness, and for the belief, Anna, that you have. Velo aviti l'shloach yadi l'mashiach Hashem. Right here, Anna, David, sorry, David is the one to say, Hashem yashiv le'ish et tzitkato v'et imunato asher nitancha Hashem hayom biyad, velo aviti l'shloach yadi l'mashiach Hashem. Basically, he's quoting Abigail again. Then he says, because it's not up to me. to decide what happens to you. Hashem will reward the righteous. And he's hinting, and Hashem will punish those who aren't so righteous. He says, Sha'ul, more than me wanting to look good in your eyes, I want to look good in the eyes of Hashem. And that's what motivated me not to kill you. And just like Abigail said, and now we see, And why these two stories are parallel, but this is different. Shaul responds the same way, right? Blessed you be, and, but David doesn't respond the same way. David doesn't just say, who am I? Why are you coming and killing me? And he says, I have no intention because and Hashem is the one who rewards and punishes. And I know that Hashem will protect me. On one hand, it sounds like the same as it did in chapter 24. Anna, they each go on their separate ways, but take a look at the end of Perek Chavdalid, a little different. Can anyone tell me what's the difference between the end of Perek Chavdalid, Paso Chavbed, Ve'yishavad David L'Sha'ul, and David just gave Sha'ul his word, you know that, okay, he is not going to kill off his descendants, remember that, and Sha'ul was afraid of that. Vayelech Shaul el Beito, the David Vanashav Alu al Hamitsuda, versus the end of our parak, which is Enadi, here we go, Vayelech David le Darko, the Shaul Shavlin Komo. So, two significant differences. The first one is that, and Vayelech Shaul el Beito, that Shaul takes leave first, and then David goes in the opposite direction. Here, and David goes away first. Right, meaning David turns his back first, which basically shows that he's not afraid of Shaul. Right, here we see the confidence of David, number one. And number two, last time Shaul goes to his Beito, but David still is a little suspicious because David then is going to go up to the Metsuda, to a fortified area, telling us he never knows when Shaul is going to turn around trying to get him again. Whereas here, Vayelach David Ludarko, David continues on his way and not afraid to go to the mountains And uh, not afraid, uh, and we're going to see, again, he is going to go back to the area of the Plushtim. So he's literally going to go on his merry way. And he knows, you know, he's really not afraid of Shaul this time. And it could be that because he has such confidence in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, or maybe because this time he does see Shaul's sincere remorse, is Shaul Shavlam Komo. It doesn't even say Shaul Shavlam Beito, which would give us a sense of security. Or rather, Shaul went back to his place, meaning his place perhaps of paranoia, his place of, and maybe trying, trying, trying to do tshuva, but unfortunately we know that he's not going to be successful again in that regard. So Yudit says that's the first time, really, that you heard this? Wow. Okay, uh, what we're going to do uh, today is that uh, firstly, we see the end of this beautiful story. And I have to say though, that to a certain degree, It's such a beautiful moral tikkun, right? On every, every way, right? That's what I meant by, I hope you love David now even more than before and see how he's learned from Abigail. And that's why we need the transition because we don't always get to where we want automatically. Sometimes we need life experiences to present those challenges. And even if we're good, we're great. And sometimes we need the challenge to make us better. And that's exactly what we see from these prakim. What is a little tragic, though, is that this is the last time that David and Shaul are ever going to see one another. We're going to see something so interesting. I just mentioned that Shaul goes back to his makom. It's not even, you know, he's going off to fight wars. Where is David going to go? He's going to go now to Achish. And from here on in, David is going to be fighting wars again, specifically against the enemies of Am Yisrael, right? Like the Amalekites. So we're going to see something so ironic. The next story is going to bring us, is really the last of the stories before we end this year, is going to be the end of Tkufat Shaul. 
is going to be Shaul, who is going to fight against the Plishtim and is going to be killed off because he didn't kill off Amalek properly. And David, in the meantime, is going to be busy killing off Amalek. So this is quite remarkable. And we already see it, a hint to it at the end of this chapter, because Shaul goes back to his like passive state and David is on the move, Lid Darko versus Mikomo. One is static, one is active. David is going to go all the way back to the Plishtim, even though he just said, Shaul, why have you been chasing me away out of Eretz Yisrael? But we're going to see he goes to the Plishtim not to live on the Western side, but actually to help on Yisrael. We're going to see then that David already begins to actually act as a king. And uh, this is also going to be very inspiring as we find the end then of Shaul's kingship and uh, truly the rise of David's monarchy. So uh, with this, uh, we're going to end for today because uh, we have a, a special presentation on behalf of the Women's Beit Midrash. Aliza, giving it to you. Aliza? Uh -oh. Hi, sorry about that. Thanks, Shani. Okay. One second. You have to stop Shani. yours. Oh, should I make you the host again? That's oh, okay. I say... can do it myself. That's okay. I stopped your sharing. We're ready to go. My name is Panina Farkas. I've had the privilege to be a student of the Women's Bait Midrash for the past more than 10 years since my Aliyah and to serve on the board for about the last eight years. I serve because I cherish the Women's Bait Midrash. I cherish the annual and holiday programming and the recharge and deep connection to Hashem that these programs offer me. On behalf of the board, I want to thank you, the students and supporters of the Women's Bait Midrash and the Joint Katedra Programming, for your participation and financial support. Your involvement gives life to the Women's Bait Midrash. Every year, we turn to the community to renew your financial support. This year, our community and the world have been battered by Corona, and we know that there are many places that need your tzedakah. However, we're asking you to maintain your support for the Women's Bait Midrash, recognizing the vital nourishing role that Torah learning provides to our community and to us individually. Your support allows the Women's Bait Midrash to bring high quality, inspiring Torah education to hundreds of students. It allows us to keep technologically up to date so that we can provide these classes on Zoom and keep a current audio and visual library on our website. It allows us to subsidize the ed programming for anybody who would like to participate and can afford the tuition. And it allows us to plan and hope for expanded programming that will provide learning for more members of our community. Every donation is valued from 10 shekel to 10,000 shekel. We've set up a program for automatic monthly donations, facilitating sponsoring a scholarship at 50 shekel a month or joining the Eitz Chaim Circle with a donation of 300 shekel a month or a monthly donation in the amount of your choosing. Details are available on the website or contact us for more details in a personal conversation. And on the closing screen, you'll see more options for donation. We appreciate your tzedakah as a gift to our community. May Hashem bless us with health, happiness, success, and geula bimhe rabbi amenu. Thank you and have a great day. Ready? <laughs> okay, everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks, Shani. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank See you, you next week. Thank Same you. time. Thank you. Yes, and I'll end with you this words of uh, just Thank like you. Abraham Avino. And uh, he it says also, he returns to his makom, meaning to his previous state. And I uh, guess that's where Shaul is going back to also, albeit not as positive as uh, Abraham. So maybe the contrast is, uh, is supposed to be uh, a striking one. Thank you. Shavua Mitsuyan Lukuchen. Thank you.